Thank you. So uh, I want to thank the organizers for bringing me to Europe, because only in Europe will the Cannabis Genome Project actually end up in the clinical sequencing section. Um, if I were in the States, this would be in the forensics and maybe the criminal sciences section, but I hope I can convince you by the end of this talk that it will eventually be shown in cancer genomics. Um, and here's why. There is uh, an ever-growing field, um, in, in at least in the States, a trend where many of the States are legalizing this for medical use. Uh, 17 states currently, and I think Connecticut just, uh, just dropped this last week. The ones in light green are, uh, are considering it in November. Now, um, this is a very large market. For those thinking about drugs like Lipitor, uh, this is, Lipitor is about a $7 to $10 billion drug. It's Pfizer's largest drug and is known to be the largest revenue drug out there. Yet the, the cannabis black market is estimated to be somewhere between $45 billion and $113 billion in the United States alone. Uh, so this is a very large, sizable market. Uh, we're also seeing that about 1.3 billion of this in California alone is deemed legal under medical pretense. Uh, and this is growing at about 50% a year. So, um, you know, what's going on here? Is this real or is this just a recreational excuse? Um, what we have seen is that about half of this is now grown in the States. And if you start to look at the causes of death in the United States alone, you can see the typical cases up here of cardiac disease and cancer and, and lack of health insurance, but drug-induced deaths are actually fairly high. Alcohol is down here separate as well. This number has actually recently risen in the United States, but very few of these are actually from cannabis, which is the drug which is illegal in the States. So um, what's going on here? Well, if you go back and look at the therapeutic index of these drugs, which is what you're measuring here on the log scale, you can see that uh, cannabis is actually a hundredfold less toxic than alcohol, yet it's illegal. This is a side of a dependence, a dependence scale, some type of uh, scale that, that talks about um, addiction potential. So much of this can be described in other books, which I'll reference here, but effectively, uh, you know, we, we've seen this number be between 27,000 to 35,000 annual deaths from alcohol alone in the United States, and 20 to 30 percent of the violent crimes have been reported of alcohol involved by the U.S. government. This number is a little bit higher in the U.K. Uh, in fact, many of you who are out watching football games might remember that Lisbon many years ago, when they were worried about riots on some of these football games, put out this press release, which was, please feel free to smoke dope at our games uh, because we don't want you to get in violent fistfights after drinking beer. Uh, this actually worked. There's less violence. It was one, N equals one experiment, but it's a very interesting social experiment that's going on here. So the, clearly Europe is more uh, progressive on this than we are in the States. Uh, and in the States, we have a very uh, schizophrenic approach to this field. We have the NCI, which is out uh, showing evidence of use for cannabinoids in, uh, uh, in treating cancer. Now, the, t the cancer treatments are mostly palliative today in terms of dealing with pain and vomiting, uh, but there are some papers now showing signs of the compounds in the plant actually shrinking the tumors. Uh, which is quite interesting. And then you superimpose this with our other drug problems, which is the legal drugs in the country, not the illegal ones, are actually going through an exponential um, rate of prescription drug overdoses in our country. So we've got a rising problem of legal drugs uh, and a very uh, ever-growing market for the illegal drugs inside our country. And we have to try and rectify this with patents like this that come out of the NIH. Which, show, which have issued, actually, uh, which are showing cannabinoids being used as neuroprotective agents for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Huntington's disease. So if you're not confused about the status of medical marijuana yet, you should be. Um, many people in, in the States are quite confused about this. Uh, the AMA and the ACP have both issued requests to the DEA to deschedule this from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 so that more medical work can be done. This is primarily driven off the fact that the cannabinoid receptors in the body are one of the most prevalent GPCRs that we find. And as a result of that, we're, there, people are finding use for this in a variety of different medical conditions. You'll see some of these markets listed up here when it comes to analgesic and, and, and chronic pain. These are very large markets in the United States. It's particularly important in cancer. Much pain in cancer is considered opioid-resistant pain, so they need other modes of, uh, of managing that type of pain. Uh, likewise, uh, the wasting and um, anti-emetic effects that they need for chemotherapy seem to be a, a sizable problem in the United States. And the, the, probably the clearest cut cases with multiple sclerosis, where people are using this as an antispasmodic. Uh, uh, and that works actually fairly well. A few papers have shown that it can actually begin to reverse uh, the course of the disease if you give it the right, the right types of cannabinoids. 
Okay, so what are cannabinoids? Cannabinoids are phytocannabinoids. They're from the plant. They mimic endogenous compounds in the human body called 2-AG and anandamide. And um, Kelly Frazier and Eric Topol recently sequenced a few genes in this pathway that metabolize these endogenous forms of cannabinoids, or endocannabinoids, very analogous to opioids and, and uh, endorphins. And what they found is that uh, mutations in these genes were predictive of body mass index. Uh, people are also finding other correlations between mutations in these genes and in the cannabinoid 1 receptor uh, as being predictive of uh, heroin addiction. In fact, there are studies out there replacing um, methadone with cannabis which, uh, to get people off of heroin, which is actually a very interesting perspective on the gateway drug theory. Um, but uh, there, are, there are mutations in these receptors um, that will make you uh, predisposed to having addiction with heroin. Uh, they've also shown a variety of other mutations on both CB1 and CB2, and it's in debate as to whether or not there is a cannabinoid 3 receptor. Uh, it's GPCR55 that's being debated. So there's a lot of um, exciting um, variation that exists in the human genome we need to consider when we're thinking about a plant that has 85 different cannabinoids. Now, most of these cannabinoids are non-psychoactive. THC is the one everyone knows about, but the uh, DEA has made every one of these illegal, despite the fact that most of them are non-psychoactive. Uh, and potentially therapeutic. So we got interested in sequencing the plant because we recognized that prohibition had put us through a genetic bottleneck. Um, and I'm explaining that in just a little bit. This is a chart of, of what many of these cannabinoids can potentially do therapeutically. And you can see they're, they're, they're quite diverse. This is the one everyone knows about, which is, which is THC. And you'll see their papers on here for anti proliferative effects. This has mostly been shown by um, Sean McAllister's group and Manuel Guzman's group watching tumor cells shrink in the presence of CBD and THC. Uh, but you can see a variety of these other cannabinoids also do very different things. This is uh, the, one of the pictures from Sean McAllister showing these, uh, these cancer cells actually going into apoptosis. And there's more work on this that I'll touch on in a few later slides as to why that's occurring. That, that, that actually came out this year. But this genetic bottleneck has occurred because the pathway which makes all of these cannabinoids is linked into the terpene synthesis pathway. Terpenes are volatile organic compounds that plants make. They usually give them a lot of aroma. Um, and they're usually used, uh, the plants have evolved them to use them as a uh, anti or an, 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 a pesticide and insecticide uh, approach. But this GPP molecule is also needed to make these, uh, these phytocannabinoids. And when people have been breeding these for one particular type of, of cannabinoid, the other ones are being out-competed, uh, is our hypothesis on this. So this genetic bottleneck has occurred because in the U.S. penal codes, they're currently prosecuted based on weight. It's almost like putting a tax on alcohol. What happens is people start shipping hard alcohol as opposed to beer because you're prosecuting this based on weight, not percent compound. So what has happened is people have bred the plant for very high THC. That has come at the cost of the vast majority of those other cannabinoids being bred out of the genetics of the plants in the field. Uh, so we wanted to sequence the plant to see if we could find those other synth synthases and whether there was an applicable uh, synthetic biology approach similar to what Jay Kiesling had done with artemisinin. Can we bring the, some of these genetic pathways back into the genetics of the plant? So GW Pharmaceuticals has made the most progress on this to date. They've gone and Mendelian mapped out the genetics oops, for, for most of these cannabinoids, with the exception of a couple question marks. It's unclear what's making olivetol and what's making diverenic acid in the plant, and it's also unclear what's making cannabichromine. Cannabichromine, you'll remember from a few slides earlier, had uh, a few um, anti-inflammation properties and antiseptic properties. So in sequencing the plant, um, it's important to get down to a single base level and go beyond the Mendelian genetics because many papers out there exist showing single nucleotide changes in the FAD binding domains of these synthase genes actually impact the chemotype of the plant. So this single SNP up here will actually ma make a plant go from hemp to THC, which is one of the concerns the DA has in a U.S. growing hemp in the United States is that the plant looks the same and you need a single base measurement to figure out what it's going to produce. If you look at how to sequence this genome, uh, we got into this with the only information that we had on hand was how to Kew Gardens, which mentioned that the plant was estimated to be 1.6 gig in size. Uh, sequencing this has come out with a smaller number, closer to 650 to 1 gig in size, and we think those estimates differ because the plant's 65% AT, and many of the dyes that measure cytogenetic uh, assessments of the size of the genome are biased when they're high AT. 
Uh, but the other thing that we noticed in sequencing this is that it has very high polymorphism rates. So this is a cannabis sativa plant that we put through the sequencing pipeline just on an alumina paired uh, 100 base pair library just to get a sense of what we were dealing with. And what came back was, uh, was actually, frankly, a mess. It was a, a very complicated genome to put together. Fortunately, we put the data public, and a few people picked it up and did pseudo alignments to peach, and were able to make sense of some of this data. And fortunately for us, the synthase genes in the plant are single exon genes and only 1.6 kb. So we can get away with small scaffold sizes and still make some sense of the data. But these paired 100 uh, reads were collapsing our assemblies. What you're seeing here is, uh, is an assembly, which isn't perfectly showing this in CLC, but basically we had 8x higher coverage in the THC synthase gene region um, than we had in the rest of the genome. And this led us to believe that we had collapsed many of those synthase genes on top of each other. Uh, and just upstream of it was this copia transposon signal, which probably implies that this thing has been a replicated pathway, uh, perhaps by transposition. Um, and what we needed to do to unravel this because of the polymorphism rate was go to longer reads. So we, we called up the 454, and at the same time, we went back to Amsterdam to meet with some people from a company called DNA Genetics. And after spending an hour with them, asking them how to triple back cross these cultivars so that we can, in fact, get a cleaner sequence, they stopped me and reminded me that DNA Genetics actually stands for Don and Aaron Genetics, and they had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, so, uh, note to self, uh, they don't know anything about DNA, but they were happy to, uh, to help us back cross a plant, uh, and it was a pure indica plant. And there's a story behind this plant. This is Joey Perez. Her mother was given news that he had six months to live after he was going to liver failure. He was a severely autistic child on 13 different meds that blew out his liver. And after um, she was given that diagnosis, uh, she looked to alternatives, and very controversially, found that cannabis-infused brownies uh, made him gain weight. And after a year of being on this, she weaned him down to three meds, brownies, the kid's now talking, and uh, he's gained 40 pounds. Now, uh, autism is obviously a very diverse disease. No one would recommend this for anyone who's just labeled with autism. Um, but for some extreme cases, it seems to be working. There's a foundation up here that, that's exploring this for other children. Um, but this strain that they used, uh, and there, she went through 12 different strains, only one of them worked. Uh, which was um, why we went, ended up going in there to sequence it. So we sequenced this with 454 on 21 runs of their new chemistry to get as long of a read as we could. And we did, in fact, see the scaffold size jump quite a bit, and the, the genome size estimates doubled by doing this. So we ended up with a much better assembly on the Indica side of things. Uh, due to time, I'm just going to skip through some of these assemblies. Jim Knight gave us some nice assembly maps of the mitochondrial and chloroplast genomes. But uh, just to emphasize the point, these are some of the long reads where you can see the variance in here, uh, where getting the phase of this is very critical. If you want to ever go and estimate the amino acid sequence, if you don't have phasing of these variants in highly polymorphic regions, you have a very hard time engaging the synthetic biology program. You need to know the phase. So um, after we got this phased, um, a lot of other data came out uh, and that helped support this from uh, both the Hughes Lab and, uh, and MIT in Michigan, where they did RNA sequencing on a variety of the tissues. And this helped us put many of these THC synthase-like contigs into context as to what they were, what they were up to. And uh, skipping through this very quickly, you can see a heat map here of the expression of these various contigs in different parts of the plant. This one was very interesting, because this one had never been described before, and our guess is that this may be a candidate for um, cannabichromine. So we're looking into this particular contig that's only expressing in the roots and not in the other parts of the plant um, to, uh, to see if uh, we can pick up another one of these synthase genes. This is cannabichromine, and you can see that the, the relative expression difference in these is quite different. I don't know what's happened there, but uh, effectively, uh, these are very similar to the other synthase genes, uh, but substantially diverge from both CBD and THC synthase. Uh, I won't go through that, just due to time. What can we do with this? So, in, our, in, in the States, one of the things holding this back is this is not an FDA-approved drug, so there's pesticides, there's mold, and we need to measure the percent, quote-unquote, alcohol or the percent cannabinoid content. This is all traditionally done with GC, plating, and uh, ELISA assays, and so uh, we believe this may, uh, there's a possibility of replacing this with RNA-seq. This can certainly be done with RNA-seq or with just uh, next-gen sequencing, and the pesticides we can probably do with some ELISA. Uh, tests. Now, that brings us to the clinical side of this uh, talk. So we were acquired by a company called Cortigen, who likes using 
these ELISA-based assays to put context into exome sequencing data. So if you get a variant of unknown significance, uh, oftentimes if you can find a biomarker in the blood, like FGF21, you can actually uh, make more sense out of, those, uh, out of those variants. So they got interested in what we're doing in genomics. Uh, we decided to join forces to build one CLIA sequencing facility, um, and we're very interested in what they're doing on these point-of-care ELISA assays because they could be used for both mold and, uh, and the pesticide testing. So, uh, we set out making a sequencing facility to test for mitochondrial disease, and there's a connection here, is that a few months ago, Bernard had discovered that these CB1 receptors were actually localizing inside the mitochondria and are playing a role in uh, potentially in driving this op apoptotic state in cancer cells. So when we're drugging these, these tumors, with cannabinoids, they're seeing that it's driving the ROS inside the mitochondria up and kicking the cells into a state of apoptosis. Uh, and this has been also um, confirmed by a recent paper that came out from GW Pharmaceuticals where they're seeing that these anti-cancer effects seem to be mostly derived through mitochondrial control. Now, um, this paper put out a nice pathway to describing us how it goes through ID1 or ID-1 and, uh, and a few other genes. So what we've set out to do is go and sequence 1,100 nuclear genes um, to, that cover all the mitochondrial genes that are actually in the nuclear genome and offer this as a clinical test by also sensing uh, the mitochondrial genome. Now, there's 30-some-odd 30, there's 30 genes in the mitochondrial genome. However, there's heteroplasmy, so you have to sequence it very, very deeply in order for you to understand this. Uh, so they've got a CLIA license, and we've been off-sequencing about 100 patients now with both of these, uh, these tests. It's not a full exome, uh, and we've been, we've been debating that question as well, whether we go full exome or whether we go with just uh, gene sets. We went this direction just due to the coverage uh, being better uh, when you use more targeted approaches. Uh, but I'm sure over time we'll eventually evolve to exome. So if samples come in for patients with blood, we run them through either MySeqs or HiSeqs. Uh, we also are looking for some growth factors in the blood of the patients to help confirm any variants we do find. This eventually makes its way out to a report via, via an iPad app. Um, the actual mito test that we're doing, we've embedded one thing into it we think is very important for us to pick up the heteroplasmies, is that we are making these standardized controls that have mixtures of mitochondrial genomes at known ratios so that we can go in and detect um, heteroplasmy quite confidently. These are all barcoded and put into one uh, library for sequencing. And this gets run with every single patient inside of the mitochondrial sequencing test, just so that we, when, when reagents change, uh, we know it, and we can sense our power to detect uh, variants, these low-level variants. So these all get deplexed, uh, broken out, so that you have patients versus uh, the controls at the very end of this. Um, so this is one of the tests that's, out of, uh, that's currently available for sequencing uh, these mitochondrial genomes. This is uh, currently in a CLIA-validated assay. It has CPT codes. Uh, we spent some effort making sure we don't have any NUMPs. These are nuclear encoded sequences that look a lot like the mitochondrial and end up obscuring your ability to pick up these 5% variants. Um, and we've put a lot of work into making a tra nice automated transposon-based library system that, that, that sequences these things. So, in summary, um, to bring this all the way back to cancer, uh, we've got a genome here that is now phased. We understand some of these cannabinoid synthase pathways much better than we did before. Uh, synthetic biology can perhaps take, you know, can, can now initiate so that we can make some of these pathways and drive plants in, in one direction of synthesis versus another. And we have all the tools we need to do RT-PCR to bring some safety and some testing tools into this medical, growing medical marijuana market. Ideally, we want to be looking at pesticides, mold, and cannabinoid content. And just to bring us back to the whole cancer theme, this is a nice paper from, from uh, Manuel Guzman that shows all the different types of cancers people have been looking at cannabinoid-induced inhibition and in, in the various receptors in which they've been, um, they've been questioning. So there's a growing amount of data that these compounds having a very tolerable therapeutic index are going to play a role in treating some of these diseases. And we believe the mitochondria is going to play a role in that. So, uh, just to sum up, uh, this has been a fun year. We had about, uh, there were, the medicinal genomics company is really about a two guys in a garage story. Lots of outsourcing to various uh, partners here that helped us get the sequencing done. And this is the Cortigen clinical sequencing team, and we've recently joined forces with them in January to try and bring two sides of the story together. And uh, we are, in fact, hiring. So uh, please uh, send us uh, any resumes you're interested to this website. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Well, I'll ask one. Then. In terms of the uh, mitochondrial sequencing and sequencing of those 1,100 genes you mentioned, have you guys looked at correlating those with outcomes in 
human populations yet? Uh, not, not in terms of, of cannabinoids. There, is, there does seem to be a lot of overlap with the diseases that people are finding uh, cannabinoid therapy to be helpful in, overlaps with a lot of the symptoms of mitochondrial disease. Um, so no, we're not, we're not at that stage yet. Our stage right now on mitochondrial sequencing is just using this as a tool to build a very vast database. It's also a clinical test, but we can record all the databases of variants that we do see in the genes. All the genes that are in the cannabinoid um, metabolism pathway are also in that 1100 gene set. Um, so over time, that picture might become more clear, but today it's, uh, it's a story of waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.